Alistair Crowley was a man who wore many hats. To name a few, Crowley was a poet, an occultist, an artist, a chess master, and a renowned mountaineer. In his lecture delivered at the Sixth Israeli Conference for the Study of Contemporary Religion and Spirituality, held on the 23rd of April 2014 at the Tel Aviv University in Israel, Chris Judice compares and contrasts the views of mountain climbing which Alistair Crowley and traditionalist thinkers. Julius Evola held. The title of this lecture is "Why is the Last Mile the Hardest Mile?" Mountaineering as an analogy for spiritual advancement in Julius Evola and Alistair Crowley. Since time immemorial, mountains have represented a dimension secluded from everyday life, where out of the ordinary events could manifest themselves. As noted by author Marie Madeleine Davy, if we consider the Old and New Testaments only, the examples abound. In Genesis 19:17, escaping from the city of Sodom, a perfect example of materiality, vice, and corruption, Lot is told by the Lord, quote, "Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain; escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed." End of quote. The plains correspond to a more base and less spiritual way of life, and for example, Cain lures Abel to the plain before slaying him. Other biblical examples of mountains representing a closer spiritual realm to God, obviously include Moses' ascension of Mount Sinai, and Jesus' transfiguration of Mount Tabor, and in his third sermon on ascension of 1498, Johannes Tauler wrote that quote, "He who will follow Christ must scale a mountain." Far from being a peculiarity of Judeo-Christian antiquity. The mountain, as a symbol of spiritual attainment, has been adopted by mystics and thinkers throughout the ages, right up to the 19th century. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, established in 1888, used the imagery of Mount Abiegnus in their Adeptus Minor initiation ritual. The concept of this fictitious mount was derived from a long tradition of Rosicrucian law. And William Wynne Westcott described the word Abiegnus as quote, a mystic name. From whence, as from a certain mountain, Rosicrucian documents were issued. Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, founder of the Theosophical Society in 1875, claimed to have been to Tibet, ascended its perilous peaks, and finally met her world teachers or Mahatmas, with whom she was to remain in contact for the rest of her life. Of course, mountains and mysticism have always been closely tied in the East too. One must only think of the Tibetan ascetic and poet Milarepa, of the 11th century, and his verses written on his conquer of a mountain peak. Quote, "I had conquered the demon who had chosen snow as his mask. The army of demons had lost its joy in acting against me. That time, the yogi came out as a victor." End of quote. In the Mahabharata, Arjuna must ascend Mount Himalaya because quote, only high up in the mountains could he have attained the divine vision. End of quote. According to Julius Evola himself, finally, the concept of the divinity of mountains, in the form of legends on the mountain of the gods or of the heroes, or of those who have been abducted, or on places where powers of glory and immortality dwell, abound in most cultures of the East and of the West. Baron Giulio Cesare Andrea Evola was born in Rome, the son of a Sicilian aristocrat, in 1898. His privileged upbringing. Brought him to conservative positions very early in his life, and although receiving excellent grades at the Faculty of Engineering, he abandoned his studies shortly before his thesis presentation, perceiving the Italian education system to be just a bit too bourgeois. Dedicating his life to painting and poetry, Evola also had the chance to correspond with Sir John Woodruff, also known as Arthur Avalon, thus developing knowledge of Eastern traditions then very rare in Italy. After World War One, he briefly associated with the Dadaist movement of Tristan Tzara, before devoting most of the twenties to the pursuit of spiritual and transcendental studies and frequenting traditionalist circles. Taking a cue from Hindu tradition and the teachings of Rene Guénon, the founder of traditionalism as we know it, Evola strongly believed that world history was divided in cycles or yugas, and that mankind during his lifetime was living in the lowest. Of these cycles, the Kali Yuga, an epoch of deviant behavior, loss of spiritual calling, and of burgeoning materialism and rationalism. To counter this phenomenon, unlike Genon, 
Evola did not advocate a return to pristine forms of organized religion, but constructed a system which would allow the individual to transcend the Kali Yuga and live above its base nature. Evola's brand of traditionalism, according to philosopher Franco Ferraresi, may be considered to be the most, and I quote, radically and consistently anti-egalitarian, anti-liberal, anti-democratic, and anti-popular systems in the 20th century, end of quote. For a definition on traditionalism, which will aid the audience not too familiar with this particular brand of 20th century thought, I will avail myself of Professor Mark Sedgwick's definition. To Sedgwick, there are three core elements which make up traditionalist philosophy, which of course may vary in their minor aspects from thinker to thinker. Firstly, most traditional thinkers postulate the idea of the existence of a philosophia perennis, a perennial wisdom handed down through the ages that represents the esoteric truth behind all exoteric religions. Of course, the theme is not new, and we may find representatives of this sort, for example, in Marsilio Ficino and Agostino Steuco, who first coined the term philosophia perennis. Secondly, the themes of initiation and inversion are fundamental to traditionalism. In order to transcend the perceived vacuity of the modern world, the traditionalists sought a 180 degrees turn and an initiation into a pristine tradition that would help them overwhelm modernity's adversities. Thirdly, as previously mentioned briefly, is the attention paid to Eastern philosophies. The East is almost always in traditional circles seen as less corrupt than Spengler's declining Europe, as well as resort to Hinduism, Mahayana Buddhism and Tantrism prove. All of these points, of course, had bearing on Evola's alpine pursuits too. Although his most important work on the subject of spiritual attainment is no doubt his doctrine of awakening, the attainment of self-mastery according to the earliest Buddhist texts of 1943, in which he advocated for the Mahayana brand of Buddhism as the sole orthodox Buddhist way to transcendence, in his Meditation on the Peaks, a collection of articles ranging from 1930 to 1935, but only published on the year of his death, 1974, Evola considers mountaineering to be, quote, an initiatic discipline consistent with my ideas on traditionalism, end of quote. In mountaineering, the contemplative and active elements which constitute the yin and the yang of Evola's tools of spiritual attainment are conjoined in one sublime activity. Quoting Evola himself, in truth, the greatness, the silence, and the puissance of the mountain incline the human soul, to which is not, not, not only human, so much that the best reach the point where physical essential and spiritual elevation become integral and inseparable parts of the same thing. End of quote. After terminating his literary efforts in editing the magazine La Torre, The Tower, his output consistently monitored by fascist police, leading to the journal's forced closure, Evola wrote, quote, I had enough. I quit writing and went high in the mountains, end of quote. To Evola, the mountain appears as the guardian of the threshold, with whom any man who wishes to achieve transcendent must com confront himself. Only in this way, he argues, does a sense equal asceticism. True to his anti-egalitarian sentiments, Evola's alpinism is an elite method of combining action and contemplation, resulting in the realization of the self. It is necessary, according to the Baron, quote, to reach an inner awakening as a foundation on which to give a sport a superior dimension and content, end of quote. Mountain climbing, then, becomes an almost solitary pursuit, and Evola only enjoyed the company of Alpine guide Eugenio David, who lived in a mountain town and was possibly, in Evola's eyes, untainted by modernity and its evils. In this solitary, quiet environment does the traditionalist thinker transcend the modern world, one step after another closer to a primordial state of being, ever flaming truth. Quote, so in a manner different than that exterior sense of conquest, which Faustian culture attributes to scaling mountains or penetrating deserts or icy wasteland, this ascension, asceticism, is a return to a long lost center in the drift of a civilization which no longer recognizes the coordinates of its cosmic and metaphysical collocation and the reappropriation of a primordial legacy, end of quote. As we will now see, the similarities between Evola and Crowley's approach will be as extensive as are the differences. Edward Alexander Crowley, known by most by his chosen name Alistair, was born in Warwickshire, England, the son of a devout preacher belonging to the fundamentalist Christian denomination, 
named Plymouth Brethren. Crowley's first approach to mountaineering can be witnessed in his late teens, where he had succeeded in scaling the chalky cliffs of Beachy Head, possibly England's most dangerous climbing location. An entry by Crowley in the Scottish Mountaineering Club's journal can attest to the quasi-spiritual experiences lived by the British Magus while climbing these peaks, and I quote, We ran up a grassy slope which hid the lower portion of this formidable obstacle, and a fine sight burst upon our astonished eyes. Behold the entire mass of Etheldra's pinnacle, with the cliff here fissured with the magnificent culling cracks some 200 feet high overhanging it, and a distant sea behind, above a mass of fleecy clouds framing the picture and gorgeously lit by the afternoon sun. The effect was superb. We stood for a moment as entranced, end of quote. Crowley would soon become an authority on Beachy Head and its perils, and as attested by an interview on the Paul Moore Gazette, dated 8th of July, 1899. Four climb, after four climbers' death in a short span of time, reporters wanted to hear more details from Crowley, who had successfully reached the top in the past. The patronizing Crowley had replied, and I quote, It is not, however, climbers who are killed at Beachy, but those persons who, without knowing the rudiments of climbing, essay to ascend or descend the face of the head, as though it were a marble staircase. This you will perceive to be a fairly numerous class when I tell you that there are no, no more than 20 men in England who know the rudiments of climbing, end of quote. With the most difficult peaks of Britain climbed, Crowley then moved to the Alps, joined by Oscar Eckenstein, an eccentric mountaineer whom Crowley had met in the mid-1890s at Wasdale Hotel in the Lake District in England. By climbing with Eckenstein, not only did Crowley form a friendship with, with last, which would last until Oscar's death in 1921, but he was also privy to pioneering material that Eckenstein had devised himself and that would in the future be adopted by a vast number of climbers, namely nail crampons, a smaller version of the ice axe than had previously been employed, and the use of nails and boots to secure a better adherence. In 1898, the two headed to the Swiss Alps where, upon many other peaks, the Zermatt Matterhorn was conquered without the aid of a guide. Throughout his mountain climbing career, much to the chagrin of the British Alpine Club, Crowley had repeatedly scorned those who employed expert guys to reach a summit, a behavior that, coupled with his rumored homosexuality and anti-authoritarian attitude, would quickly alienate the sympathies of many of the greatest climbers of the day and would cause his exploits to be greatly overlooked. Crowley's view on mountaineering are very clearly phrased in his diaries. Quote, Mountaineering differs clearly uh, from other sports in one important respect. A man cannot obtain a reputation at cricket or football by hiring professionals to play for him. His achievements are checked by his averages, but hardly anyone in England at that time knew anything about mountaineering. Various old fogies who cannot have climbed the simplest rocks in Cumberland or led across an easy alpine pass had been personally conducted by peasants up a few mountains and written themselves up into fame. The appearance of the guideless climber was therefore a direct challenge. They tried every dirty trick to prevent the facts from leaking out. They refused to record the exploits of the guideless men in the Alpine Journal. They disencountenced even their own members. They tried to ignore English rock climbing altogether and would have nothing to do with continental Alpine clubs. Yet mountain gliding proved to be a natural environment for Crowley. And in Eckenstein he found not only a mentor in climbing matters, but also a dedicated teacher in the practice of meditation and tattva visualization, which were considered by Eckenstein to be key requisites for a mountain climber. Of this period, Crowley would later write, quote, There is no doubt that these months of steady scientific work, and spoiled by my romantic fancies, laid the basis of a sound, magical, and mystic technique, end of quote. Thus, despite his eccentricity, Crowley was regarded among the most valiant of British climbers, an opinion shared by fellow alpinists the Abraham brothers, Sir Martin Conway, Norman Colley, and Tom Longstaff, who had commented on Crowley's ability as a climber, quote, a fine climber, if an unconventional one, end of quote. In 1900, Crowley and Eckenstein met in Mexico in order to practice for a future visit in the Himalayas. In Mexico, we witness a peculiarity that definitely sets Evola apart from Crowley. In his review of his ascensions, Crowley seems to be much more interested in record-breaking than his Italian colleague. In his confessions, his autobiography, Crowley boasts of having climbed 16,000 feet Itzachikoati in the amazing time of one hour and 23 minutes. Hardly believable. While his ascent of the Popocatapetl deserves a more detailed mention. 
Once the duo had ascended and descended the volcano in one bout, a journalist at the Mexican Herald had questioned the truth of the British climbers, uh, climbers' claim to yet another record. Crowley and Neckenstein vindicated their honour by convincing the journalists to go with them the day after in order to clear any doubts and to teach them a lesson. And I quote from Crowley's diaries. Eckenstein set a fierce pace uphill while I assisted his tugging by prodding the recalcitrant reporter with my axe. He exhausted the gamut of supplication. We replied only by cheerful and encouraging exhortations and by increased efforts. We never checked our rush until we stood on a summit. It was probably the first time that it had been ever climbed in an unbroken sprint. Our victim, by this time, was convinced that we could climb mountains, and he certainly was the sorriest of sights. Crowley's mountaineering career continued with the first serious attempt at conquering the peaks of K2 in the Himalayas and the 1905 botched attempt at climbing to the summit of Kanchichunga two years later, which culminated in the death of team member Alexis Pache. According to rumours which I cannot verify for certain at the moment, the only reason which had spurred Crowley to lead the expedition was the prospect of being the first man on one of the highest peaks in the world. As can be noticed, both Evola and Crowley seem to have valued the spiritual dimension of mountain climbing. But both were well read and knew perfectly about the spiritual value attributed to the mountains throughout the world. If we are to find differences thus, it is to the worldviews of these thinkers that we must turn. In my opinion, it is the different approaches to mountaineering and modern life that the true differences between Evola and Crowley may be found. Traditionalist and a staunch supporter of an anti-modern approach to life, Evola deplored the new fad that brought the mass to the mountains, and I quote from his meditation on the peaks. Modern society then goes to the mountains not in order to fast, but to celebrate, leaving glaciers covered with chicken bones and eggshells, end of quote. Evola was probably the first Italian writer to notice the encroachment of alpine lands by the ever-expanding metropolis of the urbanized modern world. Quote, immediate transformations. The Alps exist no more. It is a shred of mundane metropolis at 1,500 meters of altitude. Elegance, dinner jackets for lunch, grooms in artificial warmth, first steerings of monadic rhythms of jazz, end of quote. In modern man's fascination with mountain life, Evola sees the imprint of materialism, of triviality, a research of the hardship as hardship, a striving towards the American idea of breaking records, of being the first to conquer a peak. Evola's anti-modern interpretation of life made him live against the grain for all of his existence, and certainly the vulgarization of mountaineering practices left him bereft. Not so much for Crowley. A man of his time, if Evola sought the mountain as a return to the primordial, Crowley reveled in the very vulgar elements that Evola bemoaned. His constant search for a record to break is a clear indicator of how aligned with the progressive spirit of modernity he was, as depicted in the studies of uh, people like Marco Passi or Alex Owen or Corinna Tritel, for example. When, um, in his youth, contemplating his future career as a diplomat, Crowley was uh, soon disheartened. He had written, quote, Suppose that I make a great success in diplomacy and become ambassador to Paris. There's no good in that. I could not so much as remember the name of the ambassador a hundred years ago. Again, I wanted to be a great poet. Well, here I was in Cambridge, one of the two places in England that made a specialty of poets, yet only an ins insignificant fraction of 3,000 men in residence knew anything about so great a man as Aeschylus, end of quote. Every endeavor undertaken by Crowley, be it the pursuit of magic, chess playing, mountain climbing, or poetry, will live by him as a means through which to excel, to be on record and to be remembered in history as one of the greatest of his specialities. Therefore, while Crowley enjoyed the new vogue of mountaineering of the end of the century, and indeed was introduced to the hermetic order of the Golden Dawn through an acquaintance of Julian Baker, one in one of the chalets near Zermatt, which Evola detested so, the Italian thinker was horrified by the progressive destruction of a world that had until then remained pristine and offered the possibility of personal transcendence. It must be stressed, though, that both revered the mountains as sacred places, as can be seen in Evola's meditations on the peaks, or Crowley's poems, The Scent of the Mönch of 1896, or The Mountain Christ of 1901. Notwithstanding the differences in their approach to mountaineering, though, the figure of the intellectual mountain climber, as Luisa Bonesio has noticed, is a very rare one, and I hope that the similar core connection to the sacredness of the mountain has been proven for both figures. I am sure that Evola, behind a severe monocle glare, would have secretly sympathized with Crowley, 
When music upon the sacredness and the unapproachable nature of the peaks, the British Megas had written, the ordinary man looking at a mountain is like an illiterate person confronted with a Greek manuscript. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris Giudice. I, for one, am inspired to continue my ascent into the higher spiritual realms. You can hear more from Chris in Program 39, where he discussed the films of Kenneth Anger.